We are continuing in our series of studies answering the religious error of family, friends, and neighbors. And tonight, our study is on the fact that there are many who believe that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to a Christian. And this imputed righteousness of Christ, what that is, it is a belief, it is a doctrine that the personal righteousness of Jesus Christ is transferred to a sinner. Jesus, we know, perfectly obeyed. And as the statement was made when he was about to be baptized by John, and yet John sort of hesitant to baptize him, Jesus made that statement in Matthew 3 and verse 15 that to do so would be to fulfill all righteousness. So we know that he perfectly obeyed. We know that he did fulfill all righteousness. And so the idea is that his righteousness is assigned to the personal account of the believer, the Christian. And this too is a part of this system that we've been studying. This will make probably the third week called Calvinism. And what we're looking at tonight basically stems from the key part. We know one way we've tried to help ourselves to remember the five basic points of Calvinism is to remember the word Tula. And what we're studying about tonight basically comes from the T, which we've said before is total hereditary depravity. Big phrase, but very simply, it is the idea that every human being that is born inherits the sin of Adam. And so we have been imputed with the sin of Adam. And therefore, every child that's born is born to sinner. And this, of course, has followed through with many religious denominations believing in practicing infant baptism and things of this nature. So what we're studying about tonight, it comes from this first premise of Calvinism. So if mankind inherits the sin of Adam and is thus born into this world totally depraved, incapable of doing nothing but sin, then mankind must have the perfect righteousness of Christ imputed to him, to them, in order to be saved. So what it's saying is, if it's possible to have someone else's sin imputed to mankind, it's possible to have someone else's righteousness imputed. To mankind. And always when we deal with things that certainly fall into the realm of doctrines and teachings of men, is to look at them saying it in their own words, not try to paraphrase what they say, but to let them say it for themselves. A first quote. I reply that accepting grace, as they call it, is nothing else than his free goodness with which the Father embraces us in Christ when he clothes us with the innocence of Christ and accepts it as ours, that by the benefit of it, we may, he may hold us as holy, pure, and innocent. For Christ's righteousness, which as it alone is perfect alone, can bear the sight of God, must appear in the court on our behalf and stand surety in judgment. Furnished with this righteousness, we obtain continual forgiveness of sins and faith. Covered with this purity, the sordidness and uncleanness of our imperfections are not ascribed to us, but are hidden as if buried. This is a quote from John Calvin himself, which we can find in the Institutes of Christian Religion, Book 3, Chapter 4. Parts, I'm sorry, parts of this statement are true. 
And that's what we always need to keep in mind about false teaching. There is a lot of things that false teachers say that's true. And so that's sort of whenever we hear those things that we know for a fact that are true and in harmony with God's will, it sort of causes us to let down a barrier. But there is parts of this statement. But that's what we need to remember when we're dealing with false teachings. Another quote. In Imputed Righteousness, this is from the second Helvetic Confession entitled Imputed Righteousness. For Christ took upon himself and bore the sins of the world and satisfied divine justice. Therefore, solely on account of Christ's suffering and resurrection, God is propitious with respect to our sins and does not impute them to us, but imputes Christ's righteousness to us as our own. Second Corinthians 5, 19 and verses following, Romans 4, verse 25. So that now we are not only cleansed and purged from sin or are holy, but also granted the righteousness of Christ and so absolved from death, a sin, death, and condemnation are at last righteous and heirs of eternal life. Properly speaking, therefore, Christ, God alone, justifies and justifies only on account of Christ, not imputing sin to us, but imputing his righteousness to us. So we see that statement that sin does not impute unto us, but it imputes Christ's righteousness to us as our own. Now, concerning this quote that I've taken from the second Helvetic Confession, there's a note on the outlines that you have. The Helvetic Confessions are actually two documents expressing the common belief of the Reformed Churches of Switzerland, which has as the counterpart in the United States the Presbyterian and the Congregationalist Churches. Another quote. This is from the standard Manual for Baptist Churches. Justification is, quote, solely through faith in Christ, by means of which faith, his perfect righteousness, is freely imputed to us by God. Here's a quote from a debate that took place. My soul sin? No. Has Brother Bogart ever sinned? In my soul, I do not. I am as perfect as God himself, as far as my soul is concerned. Then what about my body? It does sin. This was a statement that was made by Ben Bogart in this Hardman bogard debate on page 309. And one more. The grounds for our righteousness is the righteousness of Jesus himself bestowed on us through our faith in him, which puts us in him, that is, his righteous body. This is God's righteousness imputed to all those belonging to the spiritual body of Christ, the church. His righteousness is our righteousness. We become his perfection when we're baptized into his body, Romans 6, 1 Corinthians 12, Galatians 3. He is the head of the body, Colossians 1, verse 18, and stands before God as righteous. We in him occupy the same standing before God as does Jesus, because his death on the cross perpetually atones for our sins. 1 John 2 and verse 4, and this is from R.L. Kirkpatrick, and he so happens to be a gospel preacher. In fact, I think at the close of last week's service mention was made of someone that, that was mentioned that 
was of this persuasion as well. So it's not just in the denominational world that we find this belief being held on to. So again, take this statement and look at it. A lot of truth in it, isn't it? A lot of truth. But it's only there to disguise the error. And that's always what we need to be careful for. So in all of our study, we come down to this point. What do the scriptures teach? So in tonight's study, what do the scriptures teach concerning the righteousness of Christ being imputed to a Christian? In Romans chapter 4, Rodney, if you will read that for us, verse 6. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man under whom God imputed righteousness without words. All right, but again, Romans 4, verse 8. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Okay, Romans 4, verse 11, Shane. And he received the sign of circumcision and seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet, which he had yet been uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. All right, Romans 4, verse 22. Okay. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. And verse 23, uh, Butch. No, it was not written for his sake, come on, that it was imputed to him. All right. Verse 24, uh, Brother Lee. Uh, for us all to whom it shall be imputed. If we're believed on him that raised us, he's our Lord from the dead. All right. Romans 5, verse 13. Better manage. For until the law of sin was not in the world, but sin is not imputed, there is no law. All right. And then James chapter 2 and verse 23, better reads. And the scripture was fulfilled which said, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. So here are the verses that we do read in the scriptures that contain the word or a form of the word impute. Impute, imputed, imputed. All of these are the passages where that we find them. But here's the thing about it. Since we are wanting to be sure that we understand what the scriptures teach concerning the imputed righteousness of Christ, whether it is given to a Christian, what we conclude is that not one passage anywhere in the Bible teaches that the personal righteousness of Jesus is transferred to anyone. And if there is, then the passage needs to be produced. Where is the passage that clearly, plainly shows that the righteousness of Christ is imputed, is given to one who obeys the gospel? Now, the Bible does say, if we know, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. And that's a statement John made in 1 John 2 and verse 29. So yes, Jesus was righteous. There's no question about that. But we, you and I, any human being, can likewise be righteous when we do what? Have the righteousness of Christ imputed to us? No. When we practice righteousness. So let's look at this word impute. It's not a word that we use that often. So it's important that we understand what the word impute means. To simply define the word, Thayer says, 
Impute means to reckon, to count, compute, calculate, count over. That's Thayer, Henry Thayer's definition. Another Greek authority of the Greek language is W.E. Vine. And Vine says in his expository dictionary that impute means to reckon, take into account, or metamorphically to put down to a person's account. So what we're saying is that there are those who believe that the perfect life of Christ, the righteousness of Christ, is put down to my account, to your account, to anyone's account who becomes a Christian. Now, here's a quote from Albert Barnes in his Barnes Notes. I have examined all of the passages. There's not one in which the word is used in the sense of reckoning or imputing to a man that which does not strictly belong to him or of charging on him that which ought not to be charged on him as a matter of personal right. No doctrine of transferring or setting over to a man what does not properly belong to him, be it sin or holiness, can be derived therefore from this word. You remember in the quotes that, I, that we had just a moment ago from that Helvetic Confession, it was from the Reformed Church of the Switzerland, which is in the counterpart of America, the Presbyterian and the Congregationalist. It's ironic, but Albert Barnes is a Presbyterian. <laughs> and yet, that's been the one thing that has always impressed me about him is for him to make such statements as this, which clearly is contrary to what the confessions of faith that the church of which he is a member of subscribe to. What is the present day application? As we said, it's a word that we don't use that much. So how would we apply this I'll use this word in, in there every day. Who I believe is the way that we can see. The bank will only impute. That is, the bank will only put into the account the amount of money to the person or the account number that's on the deposit ticket. And we do that quite about every week, don't we? At least we do it every month. We take money or to the directly deposited, but the fact is that money is imputed to us. It's put down to our account. And if it should happen to be that they put that money down to somebody else's account, name or account number, then certainly we see the mistake that's made and we know what we would do. So it must not be imputed to someone else. So that's what we're dealing with when we're talking about the righteousness of Christ being imputed unto us. His righteousness being put down to our account. When what we're seeing that the scriptures teach is there is no such thing. Christ's righteousness is his. My righteousness, if I practice righteousness, is mine. And by the same token, my sin is mine. My sin is not going to be imputed to someone else, and we'll talk about that more in just a moment. But a Christian is imputed by God. He is accounted by God as being righteous. Because his sins have been remitted. And what we mean by remitted is been blotted out. Another Bible term is washed away, which is the statement Ananias made to Paul when he said, Why tell us that I'll rise and be baptized and wash away? That's what it means to remit. So, sin 
when it is blotted out, that's when God imputes righteousness to us. And our record before God is one of righteousness. So righteousness is doing the will of God. Not someone else doing it for us. And that's what imputed righteousness of Christ is saying. Christ did it for us. Christ lived the perfect life for us. Yes, Christ lived the perfect life, but he lived that perfect life to become the one and only sacrifice that God was willing to accept. It wasn't that he lived that perfect life then to give righteousness to me that truly belonged to him. His righteousness is his. And if I will do the will of God, as Psalms 119, someone, let's see, but if I read verse 172. My tongue shall speak of his word for all your commandments and righteousness. So we know what righteousness is. Righteousness is God's commandments. And so, how many times do we read in the scripture of where Jesus, for instance, made the statement, if you love me, keep my commandments. The commandments of God, the commandments of Christ, that's righteousness. And just like we read a moment ago, back up there in 1 John, he that practices righteousness is righteous. So, let's look at 1 John 3 and verse 7. Uh, Patrick? Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. All right, and that's the verse that we read just a moment ago. What makes us righteous? We've been imputed the righteousness of Christ. No. We practice ourselves righteousness. Jesus practiced righteousness. He obeyed the commandments of God. Righteousness was imputed unto him. We, we do what God commands us to do. We do the righteousness of God. God imputes righteousness to us. He puts it to our account just as he put it to the account of Jesus. No transferring of money in the bank from one person to another but what is not authorized. And God has never authorized righteousness to be imputed from one person to another. There's no verse that we are able to see that teaches that. So our faith and our obedience to God is imputed, it's accounted to us for righteousness just like Abraham. Righteousness was imputed unto him. Now I know this is a long reading, but I don't see hardly how we can study tonight just the subject that we're studying and not take into consideration. Uh, Lee, read us starting with Romans chapter 4, what we have on this screen. Just as David also described the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only, or upon the uncircumcised also? But we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it not accounted, while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world, and not to Abraham would be his seed, through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. All right. It's not been all of that long that we studied Romans chapter 6 in our Sunday morning Bible study. And what we see is that one of the things that the Jew always considered that did not think otherwise that righteousness 
only could come through the keeping of the law of Moses. That, that was it to a Jew. Only way you could be righteous was through the keeping of the law of Moses. But what Paul does here in Romans chapter 4 is he picks Abraham. Abraham is the father of the Jewish nation. Abraham was accounted righteous because he kept the law concerning that, that Moses gave. No, he was counted righteous before the law of Moses was ever heard of. So what Paul shows through Abraham is that, yes, there can be righteousness apart from the law, apart from the law of Moses. And that was, that was a hard, it was a bitter pill for the, for the Jew to swallow. Because that was their mentality. Only righteousness can be had through the keeping of the law of Moses. But Abraham was counted righteous. Why? Because of his faith and his obedience and what God commanded him to do. So we, we have all of the rest of those verses up there. But I want us to look at James chapter 2. Um, but Joe, can you see and read that one for us? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? By works, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that man is justified by works and not by faith only. Right. Back in Romans 4, if we went on and read verse 22, talking about Abraham, he said, Therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. And James quotes that very same thing in reference to the very same person, Abraham. A lot of people of Calvinistic persuasion wants to put Paul and James at odds with one another. They want to have Paul to say that salvation is by faith only and that really the book of James doesn't belong in the New Testament because James has got it wrong. James says, like we just read there in verse 24, that we see how that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. But both James and, and Paul are saying the same thing. They're using the same person to teach the same lesson. Abraham was a crown of righteousness. Righteousness was imputed unto Abraham. The main point of Paul was to show to the Jew that he was counted righteous, separate and apart from the keeping of the law of Moses. That righteousness can be had, not just through the law of Moses. The law of Moses applied to the Jew. The Jew that kept the law of Moses, righteousness was imputed to it because that was God's commandment to the Jew. But Abraham had a different commandment given to him because Abraham lived during the time of the patriarchs. The patriarchs had different commands given to them, remember? Adam was commanded to do what? Not eat of the, 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 the forbidden fruit. What was Noah commanded to do? Lord and I. And so all of the patriarchs, what was Abraham commanded to do? He was commanded to leave his country. He was commanded to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice. So the patriarchs that obeyed, righteousness was imputed unto them. Their own righteousness because they obeyed God and did what God said. So James is telling us that Abraham, our father, was justified by works when he offered Isaac. You see then that he says, faith working together with his works. And by works was faith made perfect. We ought to be able to see that. And so he makes that quote. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Faith only? Obviously not. Faith that moved Abraham to obey God. 
When Abraham obeyed God, Abraham had righteousness imputed unto him. So then, Abraham's faith was an obedient faith. And it was made perfect by the works of obedience. That's what James tells us there in those verses, verses 21 through 23, that we read. Therefore, God said, Notice this in Genesis 22. Someone read that for us, Jed. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Remember the promise that God made to Abraham? There were three of them. Of your seed would come a great nation. To that great nation, I will give a great land. But of your seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. So here we see that God says, In thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. And that's what faith will do if we have the faith of Abraham. And if we have the faith of Abraham to obey, righteousness will be imputed. It will be charged to our account. And what Paul does in Romans 4, he explains that those that follow in the steps of the faith which Abraham had, they will have their faith imputed as righteousness. But again, that faith is an obedient faith. Two, Christians maintain a record of righteousness by doing what we're told in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. It says, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should, notice, live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And again, there's no mistake about what constitutes righteousness. It's God's commandments. God's commandments are righteousness. And 1 John 1, uh, should read that for us, verses 7 through 9. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us all sin. We say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All right. Nothing to do with this continuous cleansing that we read in a couple of those quotes. Our sins will be forgiven if, and we've always said that word if is the biggest little word in all of the English language. Our sins will be forgiven if we confess our sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when we stand before God, and when we stand before Christ in the judgment, we will be judged by our deeds. Uh, Philip, read us Romans 2, 5 through 11. But in accordance with your hardness and your impotent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous <coughs> judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance of doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of, the, of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek, but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good 
to the Jew parts and also the Greek, for there is no partiality. We've got another point that will come from Romans 2 concerning judgment. But in the meantime, uh, Brother Adams, would you read us 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10? For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. All right. So we see that we're going to be judged by our deeds. It is our deeds, as what we read here in Romans 2, as well as 2 Corinthians 5, that we will be judged according to. And we'll be judged according to the truth. Again, Romans 2. Um, Donnie, read this verse 2. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice those things. So the judgment is going to be based upon the truth. That's going to be the standard that will be used. And it will be according to our works. Revelations 20, verse 12. But it ends And that's all it did. Small and great standing before God. The books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. So we're going to stand before Christ in the judgment. We're going to be judged by our deeds. We're going to be judged according to truth. We're going to be judged according to our works. So, if our sins have been blotted out through forgiveness, our record will be clean. Psalms 32, verses 1 and 2. Jeremy? Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not do iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no God. All right. So we see our sins, our transgressions need to be forgiven, our sins need to be covered. Because blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. So imputing goes both ways. You can impute righteousness based upon what we do. Or we can have wickedness. We can have iniquity, lawlessness imputed to our account. But again, we're going to be the one that's going to determine that. Not anyone else. And we know that this doctrine, in the conclusion of our study, like so many doctrines, it, it gives false security. And if the personal righteousness of Christ is credited to the Christian, then we would not be personally accountable. How could we be? And the Bible does teach personal accountability. I'll just read this Ezekiel 18 20. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Here's a verse that clearly shows that in the case of iniquity, iniquity is not transferable. It can't transfer from the father to the son. It can't transfer from the son to the father. Each individual is responsible for his iniquity, his sinfulness. The same is true for his righteousness. The father's righteousness is not going to be imputed, much less the righteousness of Christ. There is nothing in this word impute, meaning to put to someone else's account what doesn't belong to him. If we do righteousness, then righteousness will be imputed to us. If we do iniquity, iniquity be, will be imputed to us. And one other one, Colossians 3 and verse 25. That's it. You want to read that for us? See, he who does wrong. 
shall be repaid for what he has done. There's no respect to a person with God. So not only does this doctrine offer false security, but it leads people to think that they can live any way they want because God's only going to see the perfect life of Christ that has been imputed to them. So as our time draws to a close, we have one question. What does the Bible's teaching about church discipline, like in 1 Corinthians 5, do to this doctrine? What's, what's happening in 1 Corinthians 5? The fornicator. It's in the church of Corinth. And what we see there is Paul giving instructions to the church after he rebukes the church, but he's giving instruction to the church of how this person needs to be handled, how this situation needs to be dealt with. And he says, deliver such a one unto Satan. So discipline, church discipline in the punitive sense of discipline. Paul urges upon one who is obviously a Christian and a member of the church in Corinth. So if the perfect righteousness of Christ was imputed to that fornicator. And God only sees the perfect life of Christ in that fornicator, then he would need to recognize the sin in you, me, or anyone else that professes to be a Christian. Paul's divinely given instructions, and we know they were given by inspiration, but if this idea of imputed righteousness of Christ is to Christians, then these instructions are out of place. They're totally unnecessary. And I'm not going to lay that at the foot of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit knew what he was talking about when he revealed these things by inspiration to the Apostle Paul. So all the scriptures given instructions as to who and the how to discipline is to be administered, all of those scriptures are out of place. If this idea of the imputed righteousness of Christ is given to a Christian and that's all God sees, is our righteous life, despite what else we do. And here's our other passage of Matthew 18, verse 17, Romans 16, 17, 2 Thessalonians 3, and the heretic that Titus records, or Paul says to Titus in Titus chapter 3 and in verse 10. Any comments, any questions? Our time has passed, but still, any? Lord willing, uh, Diane and I will be leaving this Saturday to go out of town, and the next lesson is going to be concerning. So many people's concepts of the Lord's Supper. Diane was talking to a woman a few years ago, and when it made known that we observe the Lord's Supper every week, she said, oh, man, so we, we don't do that in my church because we did it every week. It would just lose its significance. So she had a problem with the frequency or how often the Lord's Supper, and a lot of people do. Whether they take it at all, and if they do, how often is it to be taken? So he'll be introducing the study next week. And lesson 20 will be the Lord's Supper may be observed any day of the week, maybe monthly, maybe quarterly, semi-annually, or even, as a lot of churches do, annually, just on those special occasions, primarily upon Easter. Again, any comments, any questions? Thank you so much for your attention and for all of the men. Sorry we left you out.